Now I'm going to hand it off to Libby, who's going to talk to us about Florida sea turtles. So thank you, Libby, for being our guest presenter today. Yeah, thank you for the invitation. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? I guess Lara or Shannon will say something if you cannot. Uh, so as, as Lara said, my name is Libby Carnahan. I'm the Florida Sea Grant agent with University of Florida IFAS Extension here in Pinellas County, working in the Tampa Bay region. Okay, I do want to acknowledge that parts of this presentation were taken from a presentation by my colleague Maya McGuire, another Florida Sea Grant agent, as well as from the Caribbean Conservation Corps. And I'll share that. They have a lot of resources online for uh, teachers and other natural resource educators that you might want to access, uh, as well as Maya McGuire with other colleagues has recently developed a sea turtle curriculum that could be utilized in the classroom. Uh, and we can get those links out to you all later. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some common characteristics of sea turtles, uh, what types we have in Florida, a little bit about their life history strategies, some threats, conservation, and just touch a little bit on research. So I'm going to have Lara pull up the poll question. Um, and the question is going to be, what interaction have you experienced with sea turtles? So please check all that apply. Uh, you've seen sea turtles in aquaria and zoos. You've seen sea turtles in the water from a deck of a boat. You've seen them underwater on scuba or snorkel, or you've seen them on the beach, uh, either laying eggs or the young hatching. Okay, and so we have the results in. So it looks like uh, the majority of you have seen sea turtles in zoos and aquaria, and about half have seen them from a boat, and about a quarter um, have seen them on the beach or underwater. So it's fantastic. Quite a bit of experience. Okay, so just an overview, um, going back to probably elementary biology, I think, but uh, all reptiles are cold blooded. They cannot regulate their own body temperatures. So the environment around them regulates their temperature. They do have scaly skin, most do lay eggs, and they breathe air with their lungs. Thus, why even though sea turtles are an aquatic animal, they do have to come to the surface in order to breathe. They can hold their breath for a few minutes uh, during an active time uh, up to, you know, upwards of a half an hour at times of rest. They are a very old animal. Uh, they've remained unchanged for upwards of 150 million years and did le live at the same time as the dinosaurs. Uh, you can see this large skeleton of Archelon Isaurus that was found in Montana a while back, as well as a kind of graphic representation of what that sea turtle may have looked like swimming with the dinosaurs. So this one's probably a bit of a guess, but let's see if you know which two species of sea turtles do not exist in Florida waters. Uh, the Olives Ridley and Kemp's Ridley, Hawksbill and Leatherback, Leatherback and Flatback, Olive Ridley and Flatback, or Flatback and Kemp's Ridley. Uh, if you're not sure, just go ahead and take a guess. Uh, this is just kind of a, a fun engagement question to see where y'all are at. Okay, and the results are in. And the correct answer is Olive Ridley and Flatback. So we had a pretty, pretty good mix of guesses, <laughs> with most of you knowing that the Hawksbill and Leatherback do exist in Florida waters. Okay, and here's a little graphic representation on the top left. Uh, the olive ridley does live in North America, as you can see, but only on the Pacific coast. Uh, however, in the, they do exist in the Caribbean, not that far from Florida. So we'll see as we 
see climate change over the next years if their range may extend to the north. Uh, and the flatback turtle, uh, I'm not sure if that's covered for you. Uh, it's covered for me a little bit with our, um, our icons. Um, but the flatback is only found in Australia and Papua New Guinea. So the five species that we do have in Florida um, are the leatherback, the loggerhead, the green, uh, the Kemp's Ridley, and the Hawksbill. Uh, and generally just the leatherback, loggerhead, and green are the ones nesting in Florida. Uh, the Hawksbill, I think, has been seen occasionally, but is not a, not a regular nester. Just a little brief overview of turtle anatomy. Uh, the carapace is the upper or the dorsal shell, and the plastron is the lower or the ventral shell. Uh, the scutes are those plates that you could see in the picture on the right uh, that make up the upper shell. And you can see there's vertebral scutes, uh, similar to where we would consider our vertebrae. Uh, and there's uh, marginal scutes that are around the edge of the, of the margin. So another guesswork question. The leatherback is the largest sea turtle. How much can it weigh? So this would be kind of the maximum weight that we tend to see in this turtle. And <laughs> the results are in. Let's see, the largest vote was for 500. And the correct answer is actually 2,000 pounds. So it's a very large sea turtle. Can weigh up to 2,000 pounds in adulthood. Okay, now the next few slides, I have a slide per species on the species that live in Florida. Uh, I'm going to skip through these fairly quick but I decided to leave them in here. So if you wanna come back and access this PowerPoint later that you'll have all that information in front of you. Um, but with each turtle, we're gonna talk a little bit just kind of about the type of habitat it lives in, what its diet is composed of, its maximum size and length, and kind of when it reaches maturity uh, and a little bit more reproductive information for some of them. So the loggerhead or Coretta Coretta uh, is the most abundant sea turtle in Florida, lives in the temperate and tropic waters, likes the estuaries and the bays. Estuaries are, of course, uh, water where fresh water meets salt water, so any bay is generally an estuary. Uh, they are omnivores, so they like to eat uh, what's available to them, crabs, shellfish, mussels. You can imagine all those animals have a very hard shell, and you can look at the sea turtle's beak, as we call it, and see how hard it is. So it's if you think about form and function of animals, uh, this is, animal is basically made for crushing those shells and eating those animals. Uh, it's a 300 to 400 pound animal, two to three feet long, and reaches maturity at 12 to 30 years old. The green sea turtle uh, formerly was hunted for soup and is named the green turtle for its green fat. Uh, there are still some areas like in Grand Cayman where they do farm raise these sea turtles uh, for food. They like the coastal areas as well. Uh, they're primarily an herbivore eating seagrass and algae. They can reach 400 to 600 pounds. And as you can see, um, they're also older as they reach sexual maturity. So we'll think about that later when we talk about threats, is that these animals take many years to reach sexual maturity. So if the young are dying off or killed off for um, unintentional reasons, that's gonna have a greater impact on their species than it would for an animal that reaches reproductive maturity at a very young age, like, like fish often do. Uh, the leatherback, as we mentioned, is very large, reaching up to 700 pounds um, on a diet of jellyfish, which <laughs> sounds a little crazy. Uh, the jellyfish can fill them up that much, but they do. Uh, their length is also quite long, five to nine feet, uh, and they tend to be an open ocean animal. Um, living, if you can see their body, they're made for, for swimming, for streamlined uh, swimming large distances. And the hawksbill uh, is generally a tropical turtle, once again, um, living in the estuaries, the lagoons, but also the, the coastal coral reefs and so on. Uh, this 
turtle is one that's often spotted in the Florida Keys if you're snorkeling or diving. Uh, they do eat sponges, and you can witness uh, the loggerhead and other sponges in the Keys reefs with chunks taken out of them, and you know that a sea turtle's been there visiting those sponges. Uh, anemones, shrimp, and squid. And they're kind of a smaller size turtle at 100 to 200 pounds. The Kemp's Ridley are found in the Gulf of Mexico. They like the shallow, muddy waters. Uh, they're generally a carnivore, eating a variety of invertebrates. Uh, a small size turtle weighing in just max 100 pounds. And they nest in these arriberas, <laughs> working on my Spanish there. Um, let me see. So here's just a picture. We'll skip ahead to this real quick. Of uh, the, the Kemp's Ridley and the Olive Ridley are the only turtles that uh, nest in these arribras. So they all go to the same beach and nest at the same time. So you can imagine how vulnerable that would have made them at one point to poaching um, a legal collection of eggs or turtles. But it also provides a good opportunity and an easy way to conserve these animals because you do know that they're all going to be on a particular beach at a particular time and so you can regulate the human use of that area. A little more about the nesting behavior. Their nesting season tends to run March 1st through October 1st so we're right here in the middle of nesting season in Florida. Um, it's believed that adult females always return to the same beach but the research that we'll talk about at the end uh, is discovering more about that theory, that uh, some turtles may have the ability to, to go to a different beach when they nest. They tend to nest at night. It could be a long activity, up to four hours, uh, and they can lay 80 to 150 eggs per nest. So the hatching can take anywhere from 45 to 80 days to incubate. Um, they work together to emerge from the nest. There's some great videos you can find on YouTube or National Geographic uh, or other uh, academic resources like NOAA uh, that will show these, these turtle hatchlings working together, disturbing the surface of the sand, and then all of a sudden they, they all emerge. They make their way following the light of the moon towards the water, uh, and it's a, a big frenzy. Um, some might consider it sad. Some might just think of it as nature and ecology. Uh, but only one in 1,000 to one in 10,000 sea turtles is estimated to survive to adulthood. Uh, so you can see how it's so important that, that the young be allowed to nest you know, peacefully and, uh, and, and to make it out of their nest so that they can you know, make it, have that chance to make it to adulthood. And something that we'll talk about in a few slides is how uh, the temperature of the nest is what actually determines the sex ratio of males to females in the nest. Warmer nests tend to result in more female hatchlings. Cooler nests tend to result in more male hatchlings. And historically, that would be, you know, one part of the nest would be warmer and one part would tend to be cooler. Now, these animals uh, are protected today. Uh, they were listed on the Endangered Species Act. So what does that mean uh, exactly? It means that you know, through biological assessment, these animals were determined to be in peril. So there's efforts being made to conserve the ecosystem that they live in uh, and also to control any take. Uh, so you're not allowed to harm, kill, or harass sea turtles uh, intentionally. And that can be, um, you can be convicted if you are found to do so. So what is the status of the sea turtles in Florida? Well, four of them are listed as endangered and one is listed as threatened. So uh, it's really, unfortunately, it's not looking that good for them. Um, none, none that I've heard are on the brink of extinction, but they do all require protection. So what are the threats? Uh, there are natural threats to sea turtles, uh, particularly, you know, hatchlings. A lot of these are natural, but then as you think about natural threats, think about how human activity may be what we call um, exacerbating or increasing the effects of these natural threats. So they do have predators that like to eat that, their eggs, raccoons, um, sometimes, you know, possibly fox or other animals that would be on the beach. Uh, storms and flooding can flood the nests and completely uh, wash them away. 
The hatchlings get predated by small ghost crabs, seabirds, sharks. Uh, once they make it to adulthood, they still have the risk of being preyed upon by sharks and whales. And extreme cold temperatures can be, can be a risk as well. So you can see here, uh, generally, we try not to interfere with nature as scientists and land and resource managers. However, uh, when there's a cold snap and it happens very quickly, and researchers know that it's very temporary and a sea turtle might be found uh, floating and be compromised, um, not doing so well, having trouble breathing or staying at the surface. Then sometimes the fish and wildlife or partners will take that animal into rehabilitation for a short amount of time and re-release them, which is happening uh, here. That happened a fair bit in the 2010 cold snap um, where there were also quite a few number of sea turtles dying as well. So they wanted to protect those that, that were in stress. I know uh, everyone in Florida right now is very concerned about the red tide that is happening on the southwest coast of Florida, uh, south from somewhat in Collier County all the way to Manatee County. Uh, those of us in Pinellas County are not yet experiencing the red tide, but it's very close to us just south at Anna Maria Island. So what happens with the red tide? Uh, that could, of course, be a whole nother presentation in itself. Uh, but basically, red tide is a naturally occurring uh, dinoflagellate algae that lives in the water. Uh, it's, the red tide blooms start offshore, generally when there's warmer water conditions, and then they make their way inshore. And as the bloom increases, uh, you have your primary predators uh, that begin to consume the, the red tide, which carries the brevitoxin, and then you end up with it bioaccumulating. Uh, it can also settle on seagrasses and sediments that other animals eat, and sea turtles actually directly eat the seagrass, and then it can move up the food chain. Uh, so that's one way you can see that sea turtles uh, can get affected is by consuming the toxic prey, but also inhaling the toxins, ingesting the cells directly, um, or coming into contact with the cells in the water. So how can you recognize if a sea turtle has been affected by the red tide? Basically, if it appears to be acting out of the ordinary, swimming in circles, bobbing its head, twitching, jerky body movements. I'm gonna include the phone number later for the Florida Fish and Wildlife Dispatch. And if you happen to see a turtle that seems to be compromised and affected by red tide, you can call that number uh, I cannot promise that they have all the resources right now to send someone out for every concern, uh, but they will definitely take the information and respond as they're able. Sea turtles, if they're caught in time, can be rehabilitated. Uh, there's several places throughout Florida that I'll show you on a map where we have uh, rehab centers. Uh, it take, can take up to 50 days to clear from the system. So you can tell it's resource uh, intensive and time intensive to get them rehabilitated. In 2005 and 2006, over 300 sea turtles stranded, which represented a fourfold increase from the previous 12 year average of each year. Um, I tried to find out, I don't yet have the numbers uh, for how many deaths we've had in this bloom. Uh, generally, Fish and Wildlife doesn't like to release those kind of numbers until the end of a bloom or an outbreak as all these numbers are um, kind of numbers in progress at this point. It's, uh, it, we won't have a full assessment until the end of the red tide. So this actually, I get uh, Google alerts when climate change articles are in the national or local news. And this morning, this was in my feed. So the endangered sea turtle, uh, we're seeing it's losing its male population. Research that's being done in Southeast United States, uh, sorry, Southeast Florida, uh, looking at the nests of green sea, sea turtles and taking sampling into the uh, lab and, and sexing those young uh, has seen that for the past five years in the ones that they've collected, anyhow, they have not gotten any male hatchlings. And so what we're seeing is as that the nests are getting warmer each year and since the temp warmer temperatures yield more females, uh, they're not seeing any males, but that's, you know, that's in their sampling 
Uh, so even if there are some, we're still concerned that this is going to change the sex ratios, which could be a, a very long-term concern for the health of the population. Uh, sea turtles tend to get hit with a double whammy with climate change because not only is the temperature affecting them, but sea level rise. Sea level rise is increasing the erosion of the beaches. Uh, it's also a double whammy with development that we have of humans building on belief. Uh, on our beaches. So they're kind of pushed out of certain areas and then sea level rise and an increase in the intensity of some coastal storms uh, can cause erosion, causing the nests to wash away. So don't worry, I hope to have some uplifting information <laughs> a couple of slides from now. Uh, but some of the human threats, uh, you've probably, we just talked about the shorelines, uh, man-made structures you could see in that picture. Uh, artificial lighting uh, could be a problem because the, the turtle hatchlings need to follow the light of the moon to make their way to water. Uh, a lot of light on the beaches can be distracting to the sea turtles. There are uh, lighting ordinances for municipalities that my colleagues at the Florida Sea Grant and Levin College of Law, Tom Inkerson, has worked on so that something that local coastal communities can adopt and try attempt to incre uh, decrease the amount of incidental uh, loss of hatchlings due to light pollution. Uh, NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, has a new report out on artificial reefs and sea turtle mortality. And at first, you know, it seemed anecdotal that certain people that people would occasionally see a sea turtle. Uh, that had deceased on an artificial reef, uh, either gotten entangled in the reef structure itself or got caught up in fishing line that was uh, cut off and tangled into the reef or large fishing nets like you see in the bottom right picture. Uh, so the conclusion was it does, it does happen. Uh, it's not necessarily of epidemic proportion, but it's worth looking into the design of artificial reefs and seeing if there's any more turtle safe designs that can be adopted that will protect them as well as possible. Uh, and if Lara is able to share links after the webinar, uh, that's something that I can include the link to that research paper as well. On the east coast of Florida, they still allow beach driving, dri uh, cars on the beach driving around. I don't think I need to add any more about that. Um, just physical boat strikes can happen. Um, and, and poaching. Um, and, and marine debris, of course, is a pretty obvious one, but a lot of people are aware that plastic bags, balloons, they can look like the jellyfish that the sea turtles are used to eating. So you can have a case of kind of confused, uh, confused food and, and they'll consume plastics. So here's a question, because um, we like to talk about what people can do to help. Um, so you may already be helping. So uh, be honest with yourself and with the group and we'll see uh, how many of you are working to limit single use plastics, uh, avoiding litter. I failed Libby, I apologize. I didn't make it a select all. So oh. maybe which do you practice the most? Let's go with that. <laughs> okay, which do you practice the most? All right, so it's very good. None of you litter, <laughs> or most don't. I can presume that people that are doing these other things are hopefully not, not littering. And I presume that nobody checked the balloons because you're probably not using balloons anymore either because you know the threat to wildlife, uh, at least not using balloons outdoors. Um, so let's look at this. Um, the limit of single-use plastics, uh, Lara, uh, Milligan, um, actually most of us are doing some degree of education these days on microplastic awareness, but also just kind of plastic use in general and ways you can limit that. Uh, so look, look for other Sea Grant and UF IFAS extension talks on that. 
Unfortunately, we know just because we don't litter, that doesn't mean there's not litter out there. So some other people might litter intentionally. Also trash gets blown from the, the beach trash cans that don't have lids and so on. And, um, and also trash comes down the storm drains and ends up in the water and then washes back up on the beach. So it's great if you can take a little time to clean up more than your own mess when you're out there. Um, and there are a lot of organized beach cleanups. Uh, you can join the uh, Keep Pinellas Beautiful mailing list. You can also join the Tampa Bay Watch mailing list and of course our UF IFAS mailing list and find out when different cleanups are happening that you can join on in your region. And then of course feeding wildlife. A lot of people that do feed wildlife think that they're maybe supplementing um, the need of, of a raccoon to go after a sea turtle nest. Uh, unfortunately, the paradox, paradox is that you're usually making those animals stronger and more fit to go out and dig up sea turtle nests or go after bird nests or so on. So it's best to leave wildlife to itself and they will find uh, food in the natural environment. Okay. Uh, I already talked about lighting ordinances with conservation efforts. Uh, habitat conservation plans will often identify sea turtle nesting areas and make land management plans to protect them. Uh, turtle excluder devices are used on shrimping boats and other boats that allow them to catch the target fish or other invertebrate species, such as shrimp, but release the sea turtles, allowing them to swim out the side and not get caught. Volunteer turtle patrols, uh, you can see on the top, right, the Clearwater Marine Aquarium up there working. That's something that they use a lot of citizens in throughout the entire nesting season to do early morning walks on the beach and to monitor for the sea turtle nesting. And I'm going to talk a little bit about some satellite tagging, but that's a little more of a research effort that will lead to conservation in the long run. Uh, so I would recommend um, that everyone write down this number if you have a pen and paper handy. Uh, but the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission's dispatch line is 888-404-3922. And that number is a good number to call if you're ever concerned about distressed wildlife. Um, and you could report fish kills on that number, but they also do have a fish kill hotline that's a separate number. Uh, but basically, if you see a sea turtle nesting and they appear to be you know, unharmed, they're just coming up to the beach to nest, uh, it still can't hurt to report it because they do mark a lot of the nests these days so they can get you in touch with someone if they want to come out and mark it and you could stay and let them know where the sea turtle has uh, nested. Uh, but if you see hatchlings hatching, uh, generally observe from a distance, do not disturb, stay quiet, don't shine your light on them, don't take flash photography, uh, but you can, you know, as I said, watch from a distance. If you are concerned that a sea turtle might be affected by red tide or a boat strike or anything else, go ahead and, and call the FWC dispatch number. Okay, oops, have that twice, sorry. Um, and ways you could be involved, as I mentioned, you can join a sea turtle walk. Uh, that's something that you can experience uh, just as a visitor. Uh, I think they do these more on the East Coast. I have not heard of too many on the West Coast but you can go over there and do a walk and have a nice ecological talk similar to this one, but be out in nature and hopefully get to observe some sea turtles hatching. And I've had friends that have do, done this and it's made a real big uh, imprint on them and their children as well uh, to see. I'm sure it'd be an amazing thing to see. So here's a map and this can be accessed on the Florida Fish and Wildlife website as well if you just Google sea turtles on their page. But this can show you everywhere you can see sea turtles in captivity uh, as well as different um, sea turtle watches uh, throughout the state of Florida. Just a tiny bit here about some research. There's much more than this going on. Uh, but I want to point out that, that historically research has focused on sea turtles that are coming up on shore to nest, and then the hatchlings when they hatch, because that's the easiest to access as a, as a researcher. So there's a big uh, question mark as to what's happening to adolescents uh, and male sea turtles throughout their life. Uh, sea turtles do not come on shore unless they are nesting. So the 
Bermuda Sea Turtle Project, who Peter Malin at our local Eckerd College is one of the researchers on the project, is looking at that part of the life histories. Uh, you can look at the Sea Turtle Conservancy page and find out about sea turtle tracking. Uh, this is, they're putting GPS locators on sea turtles that they then re-release. Uh, GPS trackers only work when an animal comes to the surface, so it can ping the satellite that can then ping back to the turtle and get its, its location. So if an animal is, never comes to the surface, uh, you can't use a satellite tag for it. But it works with certain sharks that will thin their fin above the water, and it does work with sea turtles. So you're starting to um, get these tracks of these different turtles. So the turtles are named, as you can see here. Here's an example of some different sea turtles and their tracks. You can check their last location. You could get their cumulative distance. And here's an example of Bordy. And um, you can see it was tagged off Sarasota, probably by Moat Marine Lab. Uh, you can find out that exactly who tagged him. And then you can see his track and, and where he's headed and, and the distance that he's making. Here's Sertina, who is a leatherback. And they imagine leatherback to just stay in you know, deeper waters, as we talked about. And here is Sertina staying in pretty shallow waters of the Caribbean and um, actually went from Panama City, Panama to Panama City, Florida. And they just started on August 1st, a few days ago, the Tour de Turtles. So I think different people have kind of bid on different turtles or chosen them as their turtle. And whichever turtle gets the maximum number of miles is going to raise money for a fundraising uh, initiative that's specific to each turtle. So if you are a teacher or in a classroom or a parent, you can still pick your turtle. Um, you can do it unofficially, you can make a donation. Um, and you can track that turtle and learn about the different fundraising opportunities, about the different research efforts, and really get kind of your whole family or classroom engaged in learning more about sea turtles. Um, and I think at this point, I'm going to turn it back over to Lara uh, to go through the poll questions, and then we'll uh, take your questions that you've typed in or can still type in. And while you guys are finishing up, I'm going to go ahead and um, ask the one question that came in. Shannon responded with an answer, but we'll broadcast it so it's captured in the recording as well. Um, Lorene asks, can you call the dispatch, that um, FWC hotline number you gave, for other animals as well, maybe an entangled pelican or anything injured? And I would think that Shannon said, uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so... Yeah, the, the easy answer is yes, FWC will help you. They want to hear about, you know, all animals. Uh, the longer answer is if it's, if it's going to be birds, uh, that's unfortunately a little bit more complicated. FWC doesn't necessarily have the time to respond to every um, bird injury. So sometimes they'll be able to talk you through how you could try and help the bird. Uh, if the bird needs rehabilitation, they can uh, connect you with, a local bird rehabilitation center or person that, that hopefully can come out to help you. Um, but definitely, you know, manatees, sea turtles, uh, people breaking environmental laws, harassing, having dogs, you know, on a beach that's listed as bird nesting, no trespassing, uh, is something that that you can that you can call them for as well. Yeah, and yeah, Shannon indicated that minus all of the extra details. Um, and Shin, and if you, oh, perfect, she already did it. Um, I was gonna ask her to copy and paste it into the chat box. So she just sent out a link to a URL and we'll make sure we include that in the follow-up email as well. Um, and let's see, Audrey asked, are the leatherbacks the only turtles to eat jellyfish? Um. I'd have to look back. I think some of the others that are omnivores will eat jellyfish as they're, as they're available um, as a food source as well. But I don't, I'd have to look back at my slides to refresh that. Okay. And Nancy asks, can you tell exactly when a nest will hatch? Like by days or heat days or anything like that? Um, you can't tell exactly per se, but I think the, uh, the length of 
that the, that the eggs uh, have between being laid and hatching would be species specific. So if they know by the track marks or by someone witnessing the turtle that laid the nest, uh, which species laid the nest, then they would have a much uh, better indication. So they usually know, I'd say within a few days or a week when they're kind of expecting a certain nest to hatch. Uh, and, and I can't emphasize enough how important the mass amounts of volunteers are that watch, walk the beaches of Florida beaches, you know, every morning from, from May to October. And those volunteers, you know, they don't take volunteers that could just volunteer a day. Uh, generally are committing, I think, at least one day a week for the season. And, and those are early hours and it's, but it's very important work. And it's greatly appreciated. Perfect. Um, so if anyone else has any questions, we have about one minute left. If anyone has a last minute burning question, they can type it in the Q&A box on the top of your screen. And otherwise, I'm going to leave this up as the last slide. Um, we will now open up the chat box so um, all of you guys can post any additional comments or thoughts that you have. We always like to hear about future topics you want to hear about. Um, and then also, if you're interested in signing up for our next webinar, you can do that um, at the website on your screen. Unfortunately, nothing can be hyperlinked through the Zoom platform, but we'll push out the link to you. Um, and we will, I don't see any other questions coming in. So, and it's one o'clock on the dot right now. So we will thank you, Libby, for presenting today about sea turtles. And um, for those of you that tuned in, we will send you the recording and more info tomorrow and hope to see you next month. So thank you all very much.